Hello, my name is Tony. Where do I begin? Yes, Andy, where do I begin? I think with the assumption that most know what Star Trek is, a US 60s sci-fi series that lasted three seasons before it got cancelled, after which it went on to attract a cult following, then became a global phenomenon. Begs the question, why the hell was it cancelled? Because no one knows anything, that's why, and you don't know what you've got till it's gone. That you don't know what you've got till it's gone. Jesus. In the 70s, it was resurrected as an animated series of 22 episodes from 73 to 74, with voice work from the original cast. There were plans afoot for a four-episode live-action TV special Star Trek Phase 2 in 1977. Production commenced, but the combined success of Star Wars and Close Encounters at the box office cattle prodded Paramount's ass into channeling their energies into making a feature film. All the major studios had a sci-fi flick slated or in production, and Paramount wanted wanted theirs, like soon, in case this sci-fi craze turned out to be a fleeting phase that fizzled out and they missed the gravy train. Before we go any further, I'd like to take the opportunity to remind you of the importance of subscribing in order to maintain the continued growth, health and welfare of the channel. Even more important if you're able to do so is to hit the thanks button and make a very welcome contribution to keeping this channel up and running and promoting the production of new content. Many thanks, much appreciated. Now back to our main feature. The making of the film was a complex and messy process, and a stupidly long one, cursed by continuous script rewrites, technical problems, and a disparity of vision between veteran director Robert Wise and producer-creator Gene Roddenberry. The resulting movie or motion picture ended up being the most expensive ever made in the US up to that point, with a budget of $44 million. It continues to divide opinion amongst fans and audiences to this day. Some feel it to be a misunderstood masterpiece, a visually mind-blowing space opera of great artistic merit, whilst others see an overlong, bloated and boring retread of The Changeling, Episode 2, Season 3 of the original TV series. As a long-term fan of the original series and watcher of the movies, I can only give you my own thoughts and observations, which I'm guessing is why you called. If it isn't, then there's little reason for you being here. Switch off now, fool! To cover the narrative, I'll simply remind of the plotline of the Changeling, because it's pretty much identical. In this episode, the Enterprise arrives at a place in space where all life has been wiped out. Billions of people, no more. The starship comes under attack. The attacker is beamed aboard. Turns out it's an old Earth probe, Nomad, launched in the year 2000, mission to gather data. It was felt to have been destroyed, but wasn't. Instead, it was damaged by a meteor and drifted aimlessly. It encountered the other, an alien probe on a mission to collect soil samples from planets and sterilize them for study. Repaired by and merging with the other, Nomad's programming became corrupted. It now understands its mission to be twofold, a quest to find its creator and a directive to eradicate any carbon-based biological life forms it encounters, as it views them as infections. It is beamed aboard the Enterprise because it mistakes Kirk for its creator. Now it wants to return to its point of origin, planet Earth, and sterilize it. Only Kirk and the crew of the Enterprise stand in its way. The motion picture makes some superficial changes. Nomad is now V'ger or Voyager. It travels the galaxy at the centre of a giant space cloud. It is a living machine of unimaginable power, taking out three Klingon battle cruisers and a Federation space station in the early stages of the film. Two new characters are introduced, Commander Decker, Stephen Collins, and Elia, Persis Kambata. The vision and scope of this remix are expanded and enhanced, but it is essentially the same story with many of the same components and occurrences. Where do I begin? Okay, Andy, you can shut the fuck up now. I begin thus. I have certain issues with Star Trek The Motion Picture, which are of a long-standing and persistent nature. They bugged the shit out of me at the time, and they bug the shit out of me now, and that won't change any time soon. The initial screenplay was the combined effort, if you can call it an effort, of two indolent hack writers. Harold Livingston is credited with the script, and previously he had been a scribe for the Mission Impossible and Mannix TV series. That was his resume. The story was conceived of, so the credits say, by Alan Dean Foster. Foster is best known for his novelizations of screenplays. Those once popular pulp paperback tie-ins you used to see on wire carousel stands in bus, train and airport terminals and outside news agents. Exactly 
examples of his unoriginal literary endeavours were The Black Hole, Outland, The Thing, Alien, and many, many more, including, for God's sake, Krull. Yes, he turned Krull into a book, one that people were expected to read. Process that for a moment. Would you like to take a guess at who submitted scripts and treatments for Star Trek The Motion Picture? No less immortals than Ray Bradbury, Harlan Ellison, and Theodore Sturgeon, a triumvirate of science fiction literature royalty with a knowledge of and involvement in the original show. Their work was unceremoniously rejected. Now I'm guessing Foster got paid to provide the story, I don't know how much he got paid, but whatever it was, it was too much. Because he didn't provide the story, it wasn't his to provide. The Changeling was written by John Meredith Lucas. What, did he think no one would notice? Surely the cast alone must have thought, hold on there, bald eagle, haven't we been here before? And if such sentiments were expressed, were they met with, shut the fuck up if you want to get paid? Then I notice in the credits, Isaac Asimov is listed as Special Science Consultant on the flick. Special Science Science consultant, what the fuck is that? The equivalent of executive in charge of banjo maintenance? A veritable god of science fiction literature. You've got Asimov on the payroll, yet you hire two blithering hacks to storyline and write your film for you. Did you have Arthur C. Clarke making the tea? Philip K. Dick working the clapperboard? Fucking Philistines! This is one of my issues, the talent available and the potential for greatness that went either untapped or crassly dismissed in favour of barnstorming mediocrity. Paramount's attitude was one of willful anti-quality, anti-art. It's like being offered a choice of 10 paintings from the Tate Modern to put on display in your own gallery, then choosing over and above two kindergarten doodles from some three-year-old kids with crayons, crazy glue and glitter instead. Heads up arses time right there, right the way up. To balance to some extent, The Changeling was admittedly a standout, one of the best episodes of the original series. And I've seen it argued defensively that the more warmly received Wrath of Khan uses the TV series episode Space Seed as the basis for its narrative and no one complains. I'll counter by pointing out that Nicholas Mayer directed Khan was a feature-length sequel to Space Seed, advancing, progressing and generating an action-centric continuation of that story, with new developments and a grand swap buckle in style, not just rehashing it almost verbatim. The choice of director for the motion picture is either odd or inspired or a bit of both. Veteran Robert Wise was 65 when he was engaged to take it on. He had a long and impressive career, including some undisputed Hollywood classics like West Side Story, The Haunting, The Sound of Music and The Sand Pebbles. Furthermore, he was not exactly a stranger to science fiction, having directed The Day the Earth Stood Still in 1950 and The Andromeda Strain in 1971, both considered to be classic examples of the genre. I'm not fully convinced he was the right guy for Star Trek. He seemed to want to create a work of great technological and cinematic beauty that audiences would be happy to look upon and marvel at. Something epic and breathtaking, that moved with all the speed of a giant blue iceberg being melted incrementally by a spaced out dope fiend with a zippo. The pace was truly glacial. The mission itself is time dependent and sold as vital and urgent, yet unfolds like driving Miss Daisy on a fuel tank full of molasses and filmed in slow motion for the duration. But enough with the negativity, Moriarty, because this is the point where I announce, perhaps surprisingly to some, that despite undeniable factors which piss me off mightily, driving me to sanity-busting distraction, I actually do happen to like Star Trek The Motion Picture. Yes, it's true. The storyline, yeah, the one that Alan Dean Foster deserves no credit for whatsoever, is a good one, solid, imaginative and engaging, thanks to John Meredith Lucas who wrote it. Livingston warrants little credit for his screenplay either, especially considering it was rewritten on a daily, sometimes hourly basis, interfered with continuously by Roddenberry whilst the film was being shot. The money is up there on the screen for all to see. The set design, the special visual effects, the model work, the animation, collectively some of the best yet seen at the the time of release. Douglas Trumbull and John Dykstra shared responsibility for overseeing and coordinating the creation of a thing of brilliantly vibrant lens flaring beauty. It's something to behold even now. If you can put your desire for things to move, god damn it, on hold and just drink in the visuals at times, if you can go with the almost motionless flow, it will slather your vision with some truly eye-popping artistry.
The dry dock sequence is a masterclass of languid elegance, and the journeys through the space cloud to get to Voyager are a marvellously trippy feast for the senses. An experience and then some. The wormhole sequence, however, is fucking horrible, unexciting, frustrating, and swamped with turgid ennui, so take a nap or fast forward through it. It's early in the film, and you know the Enterprise will survive it, so you're not missing anything, apart from a fucking headache. Then there's Jerry Goldsmith's preternaturally magnificent score. It's as good as, if not in some respect, better than John Williams' work for Star Wars, as defining of the Star Trek movie franchise as anything else imaginable. Instantly recognisable, one of those magical earworm movie themes that will stay with you and evoke images and memories effortlessly and forever. Doesn't get much better. But the best thing about Star Trek The Motion Picture is seeing the crew of the Enterprise back together again. The gang is mostly all here. Kirk has a wave black wig now, resembling an errant ebony tribble nailed to his head. Shatner gives a more restrained, less egocentric, less mannered performance, his over-earnest acting ticks and foibles seemingly less pronounced. Maybe Wise's directorial grip kept him in check. Leonard Nimoy is excellent as Spock, but that's only to be expected. He was always the most complex and best acted character in the show. It's a role Nimoy made his own to the point where the film was in danger of being scrapped unless he agreed to take part. The studio felt that without him, there was no Star Trek. They got that right. Despite the character's unemotional, logical nature, he was always the most humane, the voice of reason, the heart and conscience of the deal. DeForest Kelly returns as Dr. McCoy, an irascible, ill-tempered space medic with a mind and soul of a racist confederate bigot. If you're looking for a reason why Star Trek wasn't in fact as inclusive, sociologically tolerant and progressive as it's cracked up to be, look no further than good old boy Doc McCoy. I know, I know, it had the first interracial kiss on US TV, and even if it was involuntary, Kirk and Uhura being forced into it against their will by alien beings, Trek kicked down that wall and made that statement. And I know it had a multicultural crew and strong female characters and a message of peace and goodwill, backed up with fists, phasers and photon torpedoes naturally, because some of those alien fuckers can be gnarly bastards. But the character of McCoy puts things in an alternative perspective. His treatment of Spock, the insults, the slurs, the taunts with frequent terms like pointy-eared freak, green-blooded freak, hobgoblin and equivalent, is still tantamount to racism and cultural intolerance. The inference is that because Spock is an alien and his race is fictional, that makes it okay. Have a free pass to piss on the guy who's different. But it doesn't make it okay, does it? Not when the whole point is not to piss on people who are different. Racism is racism in whatever form, and McCoy's tirades against Spock always made me feel uncomfortable. If he'd made the same observations and attacks on any other members of the crew for cheap laughs and dramatic impact, Star Trek would be called out and cancelled in the blink of a snowflake's anus. Ah oh shit, hope I'm giving anyone any ideas. Perhaps in keeping with with changing times in the motion picture, McCoy's Vulcan misanthropy has been largely dialed down to a few grumbles and casual brickbats about Spock not seeming all that overjoyed to be reunited with his old amigos. To some extent, I can't say I blame him, and I can understand why. What I can't understand, though, is when there's some crisis, McCoy wanders onto the bridge via the lift, looks around at the chaos, then wanders off again the same way he came in. It happens three or four times during the runtime. Why? He doesn't do anything. You've got James Doohan as Scotty, Nichelle Nichols as Ahura, George Takai as Sulu, Walter Koenig as Chekhov, and even Grace Lee Whitney as Janice Rand, and Major Barrett as Christine Chappell popping up. It's great to see all the old stagers back in the fray again, and for a fan of the original series, it's an indisputable reason to watch, an automatic source of deep personal satisfaction. Even if you hate everything else about it, you're gonna love it for that. How could you not? The new uniforms and the ultra-sleek internal design of the Enterprise takes a little while to adjust to, but you soon get used to it. Overall, it's a visually staggering space travelogue that takes you on a journey, during which you're expected to drink in the sights and sounds, and dampen down any expectation of fast-moving action. Because it inches along with the impetus of some mobile sort of technological art installation trying not to break the dreamy glass eggshells beneath its anti-gravity thrusters as it goes. 
whether you rate it as an expensive misfiring folly or misinterpreted masterpiece of existential science fiction splendor, or something fall in between the two as I do. It's your call based on your own interpretations and feelings. The way I see it, it is Star Trek. It came back and it did relaunch the franchise and prep the movie universe for more film experiences to boldly go where we'd mostly been before, but really wanted to go again, if only for old time's sake. That part's more than good enough, justification enough for me. Thanks for your time and attention, I appreciate it. Please consider hitting like, don't like, leaving a comment, subscribing, checking out my Patreon page, or tinkering with the very important thanks button below. You may regret it, but what's life without regret? Preferable. Yeah, alright. Still with the threats, I will return with something else in the fullness of time. Bet you can't wait. Catch you later, pilgrims. Out there somewhere.